Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 425th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have the author of Raise Your Standards, the Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales, Mr. Mark Evans. We're going to get into the donkey salute, the seven questions to ask your new salespeople weekly, the sink or swim test, why you need a sales playbook. You know, I just had a Lisa... Magnuson on. So she's going to be episode, what number she's going to be? 430. So we've got six more to go. Uh, we get into her book, The Top Sales Leader Playbook. So playbooks are coming up. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, HubSpot. They've got a playbook uh, functionality in their software, which is very cool. So um, playbooks seem to be the theme right now. And you know, if I sound out of breath, because I'm trying a new fitness thing. A little habit, right? It's always little things, because little things add up to big things. But I've got these kettlebells in my office. I've got a 50-pounder, and I made it my goal. Anytime I get out of my chair, walk around the house, I grab it and carry it around. I'm looking to help my grips in jiu-jitsu, but also I've tweaked my left elbow. It's been hurt for, good grief, 10 months. So I'm hoping like some reverse traction maybe helps. So um, I was walking around the house, walked back in, like, I got to get this going. Deep breath, inhale, exhale. All right. But anyway, uh, so you're in for a treat. All right. Stay tuned uh, to this episode. I'm going to give a few announcements at the end, changing things up a bit with the podcast even. So get right into the, um, to the meat of it. And then we'll talk about any little goodies I'm working on at the end and you can decide to listen or not. So let's bring on our guest. Mark Patrick Evans, all the way from near Milwaukee. We'll just do that, okay? We'll just we'll call it that because I'm I'm like near. I'm in Southern California. So, man, welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you, Wes? I am fired up to be here, man. I'm doing really great. Thanks. You're gonna have to tone this stuff down, okay, man? I, I'm a whisperer. <laughs> I haven't had enough coffee yet. Let me make sure my audio is good. Okay, audio is good. I'm gonna have to turn this down. Come on, are, are you one of those rah rah salespeople? Is that what you are? No, man, I'm just, uh, I'm enthusiastic, if anything You're just happy else. to see me, aren't you? Oh, if ever, if ever <laughs> there was a chance. <laughs> so I got your book here, Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven Figure Sales. Man, what if I want like 10 figure sales? Is that a fair question? Or should we start at seven, then we'll get to eight, nine, and 10? No, that's a super fair question. And I totally get it too, right? Um, so I wrote <laughs> the book for individuals that, um, you know, I, I would say are either the business owner that's stuck trying to get to the, the business of, to the level that they want, or to the veteran salesperson that's a little salty, right? Maybe a little, uh, how a little would you jaded. put it? Yeah, a little, a little jaded. Long in the tooth. <laughs> yeah, you bet. A uh, little hairy from the years of being turned bitter? down. Bitter and angry. I mean, not... <sighs> anyway. Pissed off at their customers, pissed <laughs> off at their prospects, pissed off at their boss and their commission plan. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wrote it as really the baseline strategy, right? But the, the strategies and the principles that I talk about, they're, they're timeless sales strategies that can be applied to bigger businesses as well. Whether you're going for nine figures or 10 figures or, hey, you want to go compete with the Bezoses of the world and get up to 11 and 12 figures. You can use some of these principles too. Very nice. So um, seven figure sales, you know, we want people to buy your book. So we won't go through all of them. Um, but obviously, you have to know how to sell because mm -hmm. your book is dedicated to my girls. So any any dad with girls, we have to sell man, <laughs> we got weddings to pay for. I mean, it's they are expensive. It's tough, huh, man? It's tough. But anyway, we won't get into that. Um, but you start out with uh, what I appreciate you know, is mindset because, you know, people ask me, it's like, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm mm -hmm. like, I tell you what works. And then when you figure mm -hmm. out what works and then you get those results, when you apply it, all of a sudden you get motivated when you got like big fat checks coming in. Funny uh, how that works, right? Yeah. So what is, what do you touch on, on the mindset side? Yeah. Of so I've really got nine standards when it comes to what I feel is to be the most important ones when it comes to mindset, right? And so one of the big ones that I'm on that we just hit on before is enthusiasm. I don't know about you, Wes, but have you ever been tried to be sold to by like a Johnny Raincloud or a Sally Wet Blanket? <laughs> Isn't it? The, it's, like, it's frustrating, right? <laughs> well, it's like someone who's like, uh, oh, I no, guess I'm I got to take your down. money. <laughs> Johnny Raincloud? And who? Sally, Sally wet, blanket. wet Blanket. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 
dude, yeah. I've been around a long time. I, look, look at the gray hair. I've not heard, <laughs> the, I've not heard those. Uh, yeah. You know, they're like the Eeyores of the world, right? Like, and you go in and if I know you're in sales, right? And, and a lot of your listeners are too. And as a salesperson, I like really good sales. I like being sold to. I like, I like the game of that. And so when that happens, and it's especially something I have to get, it's just like, I don't want to give you my money. I guess I will. Um, but, you know, if, if all things are fair, I'd much rather give my money to someone who's enthusiastic um, about, man, just about uh, sales in general, life. And, and so that's what, really one of the keystone uh, principles that I have in this book when it comes to mindset is just be enthusiastic wherever you're at in whatever you're trying to sell. Well, but can you be too enthusiastic? Because I, I talk with my people and like certainly on voicemails. Mm -hmm. I tell them, if anything, I'd rather them be more methodical. I'd rather them sound more like an accountant than mm -hmm. a super hyped up, you know, cheerleader. Oh, hey, call me. This is Wes. I really got a great CRM for you. You really should come. We're doing a workshop in Texas. It, it, it's swell for you and all your people. Come on down. Like, oh, my gosh. So, I mean, when do you, you know, is there a right and a wrong time to be enthusiastic? Yeah, it's funny because I just talked about this uh, with the salesperson this morning and it, it hit on voicemails too. Yeah, I'd much rather have some intrigue or I like the accountant approach too when it comes to voicemails. No one's buying your product, your service, your widget over a voicemail. No one's like hearing your great message that you just left for four and a half minutes blabbling on about God knows what and you know immediately clicking the buy button. Yeah, I think there's times, right? You've got to know who's on the other side of the table from you. You've got to know what type of pre people type you have on the other side of the table and really understand, all right, what, where is this person at? Um, and how can you best sell that person? So, yeah, I mean, I think you can be overly enthusiastic. I think it's gotta be real. It's gotta be natural. I think anything that is contrived, anything that's fake, it's an immediate red flag. We've all seen those types of people. Um, but I think if you've got a genuine, um, uh, desire to want to help people and you feel that your product's the best thing for it, then yeah, you better be enthusiastic about it and about helping other people. So explain to me, so you, number chapter five, uh, mm -hmm. focus on results, not methods. Mm -hmm. I, I teach something a little different, but maybe we're just saying things differently. Cause I've always said manage activity and you pay on results because mm -hmm. most sales managers are like, well, Mark, welcome aboard. Here's your laptop. Here's your phone and uh, go get them. Oh, by the way, you've got a $2 million quota. Uh, you're on a 90 day plan. So we'll fire you if you're not there. So uh, yeah, good luck. You're Best like, of luck. <laughs> like, what the hell do I do? Right. And so yeah. I always say manage activity. If, if you're efficient, you know, every 15 minutes, you're not, you're not just idling time and wasting time. Mm -hmm. The results will come. Oh, yeah. So I think we're on the same page with that. So chapter five, focus on results, not methods, is really taking that to the next step. So I'm a big believer that you've got to focus on activities, just like you mentioned before. Far too many companies focus on lagging indicators like revenue and things like that. That's good. That's important. But that's uh, what you do with the revenue. That's a byproduct of what you did 30, 60, 90, 180, 365 days before. Really where the rub comes down to me is I see so many salespeople that are focused on methods, right? It's the act activity that's the illusion of real productivity or getting results. It's them hitting the refresh on their email like 33 times, right? It's them going up to get coffee 17 times in the morning or having a chat with everybody. It's them following up with a prospect with no game plan of how they're going to move the ball down the field, right? It's just a, well, are you ready to buy yet, right? Results driven activity to me is really, it's those things that are going to move the results, right? It's, it's um, preparing for that demo, right? It's really understanding what your buyer's criteria is going to be. It's researching how your product or solution is going to uh, best fit into their situation. And that's where I really think the gap is. And that's where I think the real rub is between this illusion, this whirling dervish of activity, right? Look at all these things I've got going on. When, if you took a real hard, close look, eh, it's really nothing but vaporware. Yeah. So they're just, it's just busy work. They're yep. just, are, are they afraid to do the right things or do they not know what the right things are? I think it's a combination of both. You know, a few people go to uh, school for sales. I didn't. Uh, and I know Wes, you didn't as well. Um, oh, no way, man. I was in this top secret sales <laughs> training program at the Air Force Academy. Like I was, now that the time has expired, right? I can talk about, it was like uh, yeah. CIA kind of <laughs> undercover sales as a weatherman. So was, uh, that's a very, good one. Very elite, man. I mean, not, not many people could get in there. 
Uh, that's a good one. That is a really good one. Yeah, I think it's a combination of they don't know it. We don't teach it. Um, and they they don't get that like touch. I think we've all had that, um, you know, day before vacation, right, where you're just on fire, you can get all the things done. And it seems like time magically goes by because you're focused on getting results, right? There's a hard deadline, you got to make it happen. Same thing goes if you've got a quota that you got to hit by the end of the month, all of a sudden, magically, you're able to be like 200% more efficient with your time. So I really think it comes down to um, of that desire that motivation that want to be there at all times because everybody's touched it to some point but it's a level of hey i'm going to take this serious i've made up my mind that this is what i'm going to want to be and so i really break it down in that chapter really that i think there's kind of three main people when it comes to sales um 70 are the job seekers right these are the people that are comfortable doing that busy work right they hide their activities from their bosses they're fine you know making no more than a case of beer uh, outside of their standard base pay on a commission check um they're the people that are always constantly complaining about their boss or it's the product or it's the market or it's the customer, right? The second group is 25% of that. And that's the wannabe achiever, right? These are people that scratch that surface every once in a while, right? Where they have a day, maybe two days where they're all fired up, right? And they, they've got these results that they can get. They can really make it happen. They can turn it on, but they can't sustain that over the long period. And last but not least, it's the 5%. These are the achievers, right? These are the people that keep the lights on at most companies. They're the ones responsible for paying the rest of the staff. Staff, they're the ones that actually get it done. And unfortunately, there's really probably only in my mind about 5% of those actual true driven achievers that get it done no matter what. Yeah. And since that does exist, we see it all the time. Why does it still exist? Mm. Right? You would think sales managers have seen this, they've experienced it. Most sales managers were salespeople. Why do they keep falling into the same trap? Because you see it over and over and over again at every company. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it comes down to a couple of things. And I think the first one is, you know, being a good salesperson doesn't necessarily make you a good sales manager. What gets you to be a really good salesperson doesn't always translate well into sales management. So I think that's the first one, right? A lot of companies promote on the wrong criteria. We take our best salesperson, you know, someone who's 120, 130% over delivering on their quota and say, Hey, can you uh, manage 15 people and give you know yourself 15 headaches at the same time? That, that doesn't always translate well. Um, and the second is a lot of companies don't have a crystal clear understanding of what are the activities. Like you mentioned before, hey, it's your first day. You know, here's the phone. Uh, here's my old business cards. I scratched out uh, you know, my name, put your name on it. Um, you know, good luck. Go have fun out there. We don't give people the real playbook, right? We don't give them the actual tools in the, uh, in the tool chest to actually go out and get it done. Yep. See it all the time. Mm -hmm. So you also get into, oh, I lost the page here. Um, use your playbook. I, it's funny. Uh, HubSpot has a, a module called playbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really cool. You can build cadences in there. You can build, you know, the timing and I put actual verbiage for voicemails and things like that. Um, and I guess it's, it's probably related to the same problem you're talking about. Great salespeople don't make great sales managers. And so they were just kind of hustling, just kind of doing it. But I, I rarely see these kind of detailed playbooks, right? Again, it's like, hey, welcome aboard. Here's your $2 million quota. Go get them. It's like, what do I do? Yeah. Um, is, it, is it just the, the hustle mentality? Is it just, uh, well, if we have to, we'll just discount the end of the quarter and pull some numbers in. I mean, why aren't... Why aren't sales uh, teams as prescriptive and, and, you know, efficient as a manufacturer of, you know, paper clips? I mean, yeah. It's tough, right? I mean, the bottom line is, is salespeople are tasked with bringing in money, right? And making a, a playbook or creating a playbook, as I've done at a bunch of other companies and in past jobs and stuff like that, it doesn't bring in sales right away. So when the sales manager or the CEO or the boss says, hey, you know, what, what's going on with your sales this week? Well, I'm, I'm building a playbook that's not necessarily translating it. I think one of the big issues, and, and this is why I'm, I'm really high on playbooks, and I think that, um, you know, more companies and more sales teams need them is because... When it comes down to a playbook, a lot of the best material, right? A lot of the best ways to respond to an objection 
open up a meeting, um, respond to people that you know are, are putting up brick walls to you, are in the heads of your top sales performers. And that makes a lot of businesses very liable if those people were ever to be hit by you know the corona truck, right? If they weren't able to go to work or if they gave you your two-week notice, all that top information is stuck in between the seven inches between some of your top performers or in a lot of cases that I work with, with the CEO of the organization. And so getting that out, extracting that out is tough work, but it's got to be done if you actually want to have a business and, and not just, um, you know, the golden handcuffs of a really high paying job, especially if you're a business owner. Yeah. But you know, Mark, it's nice having a playbook and all, but look, I, I'm experienced. Look, mm -hmm. look, I have gray hair, man. See that? So, <laughs> I, I, and besides scripts, you know, I, they, they really bind me down and I just, I can't be myself and I just kind of go with the flow. I take what the customer gives me. I mean, I just feel too, you know, constricted and restricted with, uh, with any kind of playbook. So yeah, uh, I think I'm going to pass on that, man. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. I hear it all the time. You know, I think it's that ability to separate, um, you know, a lot of salespeople think that like the scripts right in the playbooks means that that's going to hurt their mojo or that's going to hurt their special sauce, right? It's going to constrict their freedom to be creative. But I, I take a page out of Jocko Willing's book when I think discipline equals freedom, right? If you're disciplined in your approach for how you're going to sell, that's, I mean, that's going to lead to the freedom for you to be more creative in your sales process, to have have more sales, to have more conversations, and to ultimately, you know, have a better life for you and yourself, your family, your loved ones, etc. So, yeah, I totally get it. You know, when I first started in sales, I didn't want to be tied down to that either. I wanted that creativity, that ability for me to be, you know, crafty <laughs> in different meetings. When you know, at the end of the day, I was just showing up and throwing up. You know, I, I use that lack of, I use that um, excuse of, well, I want to be creative for me to not do the research that I should have, to not be prepared and to not show up like I should have. And once I made that transition, I was able to have a lot more success with it. And I think a lot of salespeople could experience the same thing. Yeah. So you mentioned, um, I'll, I'll let you pick the one. Because uh, again, we don't want to give away all the all the good <laughs> juice. But you got the Almighty Power Hour. You've got the Sink or Swim test, the Triangle Drill. Which one? Which one should we talk about? Let's um, let's do something for the Sink or Swim test. All right. I, you know, I, I'm swimming three and a half miles across Tampa Bay uh, on this Ooh. Sunday. So uh, uh, if hopefully I survive. So when this is goes live, you know, well, hopefully I survive so I can go live with this. You know, otherwise this is just going to sit on the archives and, and it'll never go out. But uh, this will always be a good memory for me. So, yeah, I like this sink or swim test. Yeah. Well, the sink or swim test, I really designed it for companies that were starting salespeople, right? And so one of the questions that I always posed to business owners or sales leaders was, well, how do you know if a salesperson is one, ready to start selling your product or two, that your like training process and your onboarding procedures are actually working? And I got a lot of the, you know, donkey salutes when that would happen of just a, uh, what? Um, <laughs> You know, we don't have that Dude, where around are you here. From? You're like you're you're from the backwoods of uh the suburbs of Milwaukee. That's three things now. What the donkey look? Uh, the the donkey salute, right? Have you ever seen that? Salute. Like, you, yeah, no, you I know what kids. you mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, like, like just the head down. Like I don't know. You know, I'm gonna try to avoid eye contact when you've trained people or anything like that. Does anybody have an answer? No, donkey salute. <laughs> So I all, right, these, all right, so, keep going. I'm sorry. So I, I, no, I that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. So I get the donkey salute, right? And I got really frustrated with companies that would say like, well, they're ready when we think they're ready. Well, like that's not good enough, right? That's not good enough if you're trying to pitch your client or to really grow your business. So I came up with something called the sink or swim test. And basically what it is, is it, it comes down to a couple of key questions. And this is something that as the sales manager, as the leader, as the CEO, you got to have discipline with it. But it's a test you give that new salesperson every single week. And I often give veteran salespeople this test too. Um, but it basically comes down to the following, you know, seven questions of, hey, tell me the main solutions we provide. Give me three examples of our competition. Name three of the most common objections we hear. Tell me three things that make us unique. You know, what makes our company awesome? Uh, if we met at a bar or a backyard cookout, how would you describe our company? 
what types of leads are not a good fit for us and give me three qualifying questions you can ask to confirm that a lead is a good fit. And so I ask new salespeople this, I tell them in advance on their first day of, hey, this is what your sink or swim test, this is what um, on Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon, you're gonna get this test and you're gonna be in front of the whole sales team or it's gonna be just with me and you're gonna have to answer these questions. And um, I think it's really important for the first 90 days to have this every single week because you don't necessarily in the first week, you're not looking for mastery of these topics, but you want to see an improvement and you want to see enthusiasm. And I've seen entire companies just with the asking of these questions to themselves and to their entire staff can totally pivot their marketing message and pivot their sales message. Cause it turned out that all salespeople definitely weren't in alignment. The CEO definitely wasn't in alignment and the sales manager definitely wasn't in alignment. So it just brings a lot to light. Um, hey, what, what are we going to sell? How are we going to sell? Yeah, but we have mission statements painted on a mural on the wall. <laughs> and and we check our ego at the door and and we value the entrepreneurial spirit. I think that's just too restrictive to know these seven things. I mean, you're just very money driven. You're like a greedy salesperson, aren't you? You are yes, I am. I am. I'm here to make you money with that. <laughs> Yep. I love it. Cause I, I have like working with, uh, with VAs and, and just other team members. I've always had three questions. You know, I said, mm. send this to me at the end of every day. What did you accomplish today? Uh, what obstacles did you encounter and what help do you need from me? Love it. You know? So I just wanted to keep it simple. Uh, just for staff, you know, it's like, cause uh, you need them checking in, especially virtual, right? Yeah. It's like, what's going on folks. Cause it's, it's too easy for things to just drift off course. You know, you go two weeks, three weeks of things not going right. You're like, why didn't that launch or whatever? Oh, I, did, mm -hmm. I was afraid to ask or I thought I could do it. I'm like, oh my gosh. Nothing more frustrating than that, right? That's something that could be completely avoided. Um, yeah, just moves you a little bit off. It's super frustrating. Yeah, and because I, I love too what you said earlier about um, um, what is it? Uh, lagging indicator, right? Leading versus lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. You know, your quota is a lagging indicator. You know, if you yep. sold it or not, I mean, and everybody, you know, three weeks left in the quarter, now they're panicking. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of if they're doing this every single week, they're going to know if you're on track or not. Yeah. You know, it's better to find out that you're 50% off course one week into the quarter than, you know, two months into the quarter. Uh, yeah, it's a lot harder to fix, huh? And yeah, with that test, right, it all comes down to, you know, is there improvement going on? The last thing you want to do is find out seven, eight, nine months down the road, oh, the salesperson that we hired isn't performing, right? They're not coming up to quota. And if you ask them a couple of questions and they can't even articulate, you know, what the company does or the value proposition or who some of their customers are, well, shame on you. That's on you. That's not on them. That's on you and your training. Yeah. Yeah, I love your story about keeping score. I've always told that same thing. And, you know, obviously, I always say if you can measure it, you can improve it, mm. right? And what do you think like about that. having like a, a daily leaderboard or, or something shared across the company uh, on like production totals? Yeah, I love it. I think that it's a really good thing. You know, that's what makes sales great or one of the things that makes sales great, right? Like, how do you know you've got a good accountant? Well, I haven't gotten audited and, you know, I guess the IRS isn't beating down my door. Like accountants can't, you know, uh, go into a pissing match against each other of like who's better than the other. But salespeople certainly can. And we've got a scorecard that will exactly show that. Um, and that's why I think sales is great. And if you're not going to keep scoring sales, you're doing yourself a big disservice because you chances are you don't want to hurt people's egos or you don't want to bru bruise their personalities or something like that. But I think you get so much more out of keeping score and using that as a motivating factor for salespeople. All right, man, where I just lost it. It was your best social self, right? Where mm -hmm. I need my glasses, man. Your best, there you go, page 125, number 20. So should individual salespeople, like how much leeway should they be given on social media to be putting out their own content or answering questions and things like that? 
Yeah, well, I think it all depends on like the size of the business and the size of the company, right? If you're one of, you know, a couple hundred salespeople, well, then you probably should have some guidelines and some rules in place in order to make sure that you're posting, um, or at least you have some good rules of thumb, right? When it comes to, to social media. But if you're a small organization, you know, I'd much rather have to uh, uh, rein in someone when it comes to social than I would have to say like, come on, let's go. Like, let's, you know, have to motivate with that. Um, so I think it all kind of comes down to your organization size. And, and again, how, like, how entrepreneurial is your organization? How aggressive is your organization when it comes down to some of those things? And, and just having some really clear uh, rules when it comes to that stuff. Well, should they be entrepreneurial? You know, uh, one of my biggest, you know, first sales training clients was Dell mm. way back in 2007. Wow. Uh, and their salespeople were not entrepreneurial. I mean, they, they didn't exactly encourage it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I see that a lot with, with the big mega corporations. Um, but the reality was like the top performers always had a little entrepreneurial edge to them. Yeah. You know, so, but, but how entrepreneurial should a salesperson be? Yeah. I mean, you know, I can't, I'm not going to argue against the success of Dell and, and their sales staff, but I mean, yeah, I think you need, if you don't have some of those intangibles that entrepreneurs need to have when it comes to sales, uh, I, I don't think that they're going to have the success that the entrepreneurial salesperson is going to have. I mean, for someone to get up day after day and talk to people that don't want to be talked to, right. That don't want to hear your pitch that, you know, are just so in tuned to saying no to you all the time to get up and do that day in and day out. You've got to have some creativity. You got to have some flexibility. You got to have some of those attributes that entrepreneurs uh, possess and demonstrate on a day to day basis. And yeah, I, I mean, I I've seen the top salespeople that I've worked with all, all carry some of those key entrepreneurial fundamentals. I like it. I had to hit mute there. We're, we do homeschooling, man. We got a uh, Tuesdays. We host. Oh, cool. Got, like 20 young, <laughs> like tween. What do they call them? Tweeners or whatever. I don't Tween, know. What yeah. Else? What is my daughter? Yeah. She's 12. So yeah. There's some 12, some are 13s in that range. Oh my gosh. Oh man. I'll oh, be joining you there shortly. That's why I'm selling, man. That's why I got to keep selling. <laughs> All right, man. So what's the final words of wisdom? You know, I used to always do this and uh, now you're reminding me. I would ask my guests, say, all right, our listeners are jogging, they're on a mountain bike, treadmill, whatever. So they're just listening as they're doing something else. Um, what should they do as a result of listening to this? Yeah. Uh, what one thing should they apply, you know, to make this, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes in a podcast worth their time? Well, besides applying their credit card to go buy the book, which I think is a, if you've gotten anything out of this, you're going to love the book. That's a give. That's a give. I, I, you know, I'll do the intro and outro. I'm going to say, buy his book. But anyway. <laughs> Well, it's a sales podcast. So I feel like you get a little leniency when it, when it comes to a pitch with that. Oh, um, yeah. Would be one of the topics, and we didn't cover it in this conversation, but I go into detail with my book, is I really think in 2020, what's going to separate the salespeople that are crushing quotas versus those that aren't um, is going to come in the form of follow-up, right? And being very, very, I shouldn't say very aggressive, but uh, individuals that are pursuing customers and pursuing prospects. And what I mean by that is not just showing up and throwing up and sending one email or making one phone call and praying that, oh, I really hope that this prospect calls me back. Let's face it, Wes, people are busier now than ever, especially when it comes to executives. I was in a training recently where I have people raise their hand. Um, when I say, how many emails do you get in a day? You know, 100, 200. I had to stop at like 800. This guy gets over 800 emails a day. And this is an executive that a lot of people would want to sell to. And so if you think that your one email and your one voicemail is going to stand out in this, you know, vastness of uh, emails and text messages and social media, you're wrong. You're just fooling yourself. So I think 2020, if you take anything from this book is look to increase the amount of touches you have for your prospects, as well as to your current customers, because chances are you're not reaching out enough. You're not reaching out frequently enough and you're not delivering value in those messages. And that's my final word. Well, you know, I mean, there, there is that one key message, but I, I sold it to a company for millions of dollars and I had an NDA and I told them I wouldn't sell it again for another 10 years. So until those time passes, right? They should probably get your book to, to figure out how else to do it. 
I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, it. man. So where do we send them? So we got your book. I got your book here. It's on Amazon. Uh, your website, though, uh, it's your name, right? MarkPatrickEvans.com. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. So I will repeat that a few times in the intro and outro. Um, well, man, thanks for coming to the show. It's been great. Thank you for having me, Wes. I really appreciate it. I enjoy talking with you. All right, man. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Is it time you raised your standards? I don't know if I've told this story recently, but when I was first learning golf, man, I was 23 years old. My dad got me golf lessons. Uh, I was at Texas A&M, about to graduate, and went to the Middle East. So that was 93 to 94. So I'm in SoCal, end of 94. And I found this golf pro and I started taking some lessons. <clears throat> but um, I, was, I, mean, I was a big guy. I was 6'2", 225 pounds, strong, strong as an ox. I mean, like doing lunges with 225 pounds, like doing sets of inclines at two, 275, even sometimes 315, just crazy. But I'm, I'm reading all these books, I'm watching all these videos, and you know they were saying that the average golfer hit – I think it was a seven iron, 150 yards. It could have been an eight. I forget exactly, but uh, I think it was a seven. And so I'm hitting a seven iron and I cannot reach 150 yards and just flubbing it, flubbing it, flubbing it. And then just out of sheer frustration, I just put that club down and picked up an eight and boom, like hit it past 150. Then I, I realized like a nine iron was my club somewhere like a, a full nine, you know, an easy eight was all I needed to go 150. So what was happening, that subconsciously, I knew that was too much club. I knew just being a big, young, strong guy, I could hit the ball hard. And so in golf, regardless of all the fancy lessons they want to teach you, all you have to do is hit the golf ball with an accelerated descending blow with a square club face at impact. That's it. That's all you're trying to do. All these lessons with your feet and knees and bands and holding a towel under your armpits and uh, V's and A's and blah, blah, blah. That's all you have to do. And so when I could put a full swing on the ball, good things happened. So I literally had to raise my standards. I, I was... I was aiming too low and I was underperforming even that low goal. So, I mean, there's an art to setting proper goals. There's an art to making them achievable, but still making them stretch. Okay. They should push you just like when you exercise, if you don't lift to exhaustion, to failure, you don't create adequate tears in the muscle. Literally, you're not breaking it down enough. So it can rebuild, basically, scar tissues, what the muscle is. You've got to push all the way to failure. So what are those goals, though? What do you have? And it's hard. We get in our comfort zone, and it's hard to create those kind of goals and stick with it. It just is. Okay? And so uh, that's why I liked having Mark on. I liked his book. You know, and that's why I'm bringing out programs like... The five, right? The five dot US, five people, five weeks. We're going to get after it. Then we're going to meet for two days in person to help you raise your standards. So come join, all right? The five dot US. First one's about to kick off uh, February 20th. So come on out. Um, and because it's a small group, you're not going to be able to hide. So. You need to be comfortable being pushed. You need to want to be pushed. Um, you know, like he said in the interview, right, it's more than showing up and throwing up or firing off an email or two. Growing today is tough. Uh, there's a lot going on. You know, I, I had two guests on today because uh, usually I'm, I'm three to six weeks ahead. And um, I had David Moore on. Um, he'll, he's coming up in a few episodes, but we talked about he's digital marketing, uh, doing promos and paid ads for guys like Tony Robbins. And he's saying, yeah, it's easier than ever, you know, but the, the, 
the downside to being easier than ever to run ads is that everybody's running ads. So it's noisy. So it's always, it's this constant yin and yang. It's, it's this teeter-totter you're running back and forth on. And it takes, I don't know, it takes a lot of discipline, but when you have a good team, when you're surrounded by good people that want you to succeed, when you've got a good coach pushing you, supporting you, you are less likely to get frustrated. When you do get frustrated, it won't be as severe, it won't last as long, so you can get back on your game. All right, that's just how it is. Uh, I talk about jujitsu a lot. You know, I just rolled at noon today, and I'm recording this about four o'clock before we publish it. You know, so I went today. It's Tuesday. We do no gi, so it's slippery. It's hard. It's super fast, much faster than fighting with a gi. And we all stagnate sometimes. We we get caught in things we shouldn't get caught. And the solution. So I've been doing this over three years. And the solution every single time is simple. It's crazy. It's simple, and yet you don't see it because you're too close to the action. I rolled yesterday with a new black belt, Cody. The guy is just sick. Uh, he had me in a tight spot. And he, he, he's really good at coaching you through scenarios. He didn't just smash. And he's just like, okay, do this. One simple thing. It didn't require strength. It didn't require agility. It didn't require extreme flexibility or quickness. It was just a simple turn, just turning in the right direction. Uh, and it was two related moves. The counter was the same for both. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, and it's, it's like this in your business. There's something right under your nose that you're missing. And a peer, right, in the five, a peer in the inner circle, uh, someone like me looking in from the outside, it's so obvious. So invest in yourself, right? Stop looking for crazy programs. Stop looking for someone that's going to promise you the moon and the stars. You're just going to be let down. I'm telling you, invest in yourself. Then when you know what to do, then you can go hire people to execute your vision, execute your instructions. That's the key to growth. Okay. That's what I'll help you do in the five dot us. If you're a bigger company and you're looking for a great speaker, let me know. HireTheBestSpeaker.com. I'll come in for your keynote. I'll stay sober. I'll help you promote it. I'll stick around for breakout sessions. I'll customize the talk. Your people will get a lot out of it. So HireTheBestSpeaker.com. And if you just want me to come in and talk to the team, maybe do a, an on-site, one-day, two-day, uh, I can do that as well. Just hit me up, okay? The TheSalesWhisperer.com. And just fill out the contact us and we'll be in touch. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.